This is the content that I'm going to start to cover for the second module, starting with chapter four. In chapter four, we're going to look at interpersonal communication and the self. And these are some of the concepts that we're going to cover. Communication and the self-concept, presenting the self, and then disclosing the self. And these are the learning objectives. We're going to describe how the self-concept is subjective and is shaped by and consequently affects communication with others. We're going to explain how you manage impressions in person and online to enhance your presenting image. And then we're going to identify an optimal level of self-disclosure and non-disclosure in effective relationships. Let's start with communication and the self-concept. Communication affects self-concept, which is the relatively stable set of perceptions that you hold for yourself. And then you have self-esteem. And that is the part of, your, of the self-concept that involves evaluations of your self-worth. Right here, the communication perception and feedback loop, which can be found in the book, this starts to look at your self-esteem and evaluations. So a self-esteem evaluations begin at a young age and have a powerful effect on your communication. So people who feel good about themselves have a positive expectations about how they're going to communicate. And these feelings increase the chance that communication will be successful. And the success is generally contributed to positive self-evaluations, which reinforces your self-esteem. Unfortunately, the same thing can happen on the negative side. Uh, when you start to have negative feelings and negative thoughts like I can't do it or, you know, it's too hard or you just give up and won't even try, then that can perpetuate negative thoughts about thinking that you failed or perpetuate that negative cycle. One study found that people with low self-esteem don't do well on social networking sites because they tend to post more negative information and people are less likely to respond to these messages, which can be a tool for, you know, generally this could be a tool to connect with other people, but if you already have negative self-esteem or low self-esteem, it could actually affect that in the opposite way. People with high self-esteem may think they make better impressions than others and have better friendships and romantic lives but neither impartial observers nor objective tests uh, verify these beliefs. How does the self-concept develop? The self-concept develops and evolves through our social interaction. And reflected appraisal is the process of mirroring the judgments of surrounding people. Uh, a significant other is, is described uh, as a person who evalu who, whose evaluations are especially influential. Social comparison describes the way that we evaluate ourselves as compared to others and in relation to reference groups. Reference groups are people we use to evaluate our own characteristics. I think that social comparison, you see that a lot on social media as well, where we're trying to compare you know, what we look like, what we post online to what other people are posting. And then we start to look at characteristics of self-concept. The self-concept is subjective. The way we view ourselves may be at odds with how other people view ourselves and their perception. Sometimes we have an unrealistic, uh, an unrealistic view of our self-appraisal. One study even found that online daters often tend to have a foggy mirror, and that means that they see themselves more positive, positively than other people do. The self-concept is subjective so that the way we view ourselves is not the same, and the distortions may occur for four principal reasons. The first is obsolete information. The second is distorted feedback from others. 
La the next could be perfectionism and last is social expectations where we downplay our accomplishments. A healthy self-concept is flexible. It can change as needed to remain realistic. And a healthy self-concept is multifaceted. Some are large and readily visible like genuine kindness while others are small and hidden below the surface like being unkind when you get stressed out or somebody is treating you negatively or poorly. The self-concept resists change and the tendency to resist uh, revisions of our self-concept is strong. We generally seek out information that affirms and conforms to an existing self-concept. That process is called cognitive conservatism. We basically try to find information that validates how we already see our self-concept. People who have uh, unnecessarily negative self-esteem can become their own worst enemies because they also deny themselves the validation they deserve and the need to enjoy satisfying relationships. If you need to change your self-concept, the best idea could be to surround yourself with significant others who offer you accurate and affirming messages about who you are and who you're becoming. I think it really is important to surround yourself with the people that are positive or reinforcing values and traits about yourself and how you want to be seen. I'm not sure if any of you have seen this commercial uh, from the Dove Evolution. It's about a minute long. If you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend that you watch it. It just is really interesting because it shows this model in the beginning before she has makeup on and then they add makeup and do her hair and you know start taking pictures on a photo shoot and then it shows all the edits that are made in photoshop and put on the billboard just to show how unrealistic the beauty standards are when we're comparing ourselves to a person that literally isn't even real or doesn't exist The self-fulfilling prophecy and communication. A, the self-fulfilling prophecy, this occurs when a person's expectations of an event affects his or her behavior and therefore makes the predicted outcomes more likely to occur than would have otherwise been true. The belief about the outcomes affects the communication. So let's talk about an example of this. Uh, this could be a slightly exaggerated example. So one morning you read your horoscope, which offers the following prediction. Today you will meet the person of your dreams and the two of you will live happily ever after. Let's assume that you believe in horoscopes. What will you do? You'll probably start making plans to go out on the town that night in search of your dream person. You might dress up, groom yourself well, and carefully evaluate every person that you encounter. You'll also try to be attentive and charming and witty, polite and gracious when you end up meeting a good candidate who fits what you're looking for. As a result, that person is likely to be impressed and attracted to you. And then, lo and behold, the two of you end up living happily ever after. <laughs> Your conclusion, the horoscope had to be right, it, that it was correct, because exactly what it said happened. But did it really happen or did you try to make that happen? Because when we start to look at it further, the horoscope helped you create the expectation. It really wasn't the key to your success. So it may have got the ball rolling uh, because it started to make you think positive and encourage you to go out and encourage you to dress up, which is maybe something you normally weren't going to do that night and then eventually it led to you meeting this person that you were compatible with otherwise maybe you would have stayed home and maybe you wouldn't have gone out that night so hence it instead of crediting the horoscope for the outcome it's important to realize that you were responsible for making this happen 
hence the term self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's two types of self-fulfilling self -fulfilling prophecies. When your own expectations influence your behavior and then one, one person's expectations govern another's actions. So examples of this, um, you've probably had the experience of waking up in a bad mood and saying to yourself, this is going to be a bad and terrible day. But once you made that decision, you may have acted in ways or that make that statement come true. Maybe you were sitting in your room by yourself, avoiding people, had short responses, were grumpy to people. On the other hand, if you approached the day with the idea that it was going to be great and you felt wonderful today, you're likely to communicate in ways that will bring good things or that people are going to respond to in a positive way. In the second category of the self-fulfilling prophecies is the one when one person's expectations govern another actions. So an example is experimenting. Experimenters told teachers that 20% of the children in a certain elementary school showed unusual potential for intell intellectual growth. The names of the 20% were drawn by means of a table of random numbers, much as if they were drawn out of a hat. Eight months later, these children showed significantly greater gains in IQ than did the remaining children who had not been singled out for the teacher's attention. The change in the teacher's behavior towards these alleged special children led to changes in their intellectual performance. Among other things, the teachers gave the smart students more time to answer questions and provided more feedback to them. These children did better not because they were more intelligent than the other students in the class, but because their teacher communicated that expectation. So notice that this isn't just the observer's belief that created a self-fulfilling prophecy for the person who is the target of the expectations. The observer must communicate that belief verbally or non-verbally for the prediction to have any effect. So presenting the self and impression management. Impression management refers to the communication strategies people use to predict the self and to influence how other people view them. We have different types of self. Uh, we, oh, sorry, let me scroll down. We have our public self and our private self. The perceived self is the person you believe yourself to be in the moments of your most honest self-examination. The presenting self is the public image that we want to present to others. And then face is socially approved identity that we present. Face work is verbal and nonverbal actions to maintain our face in the face of others. And some examples of that. Your perceived self may not be the accurate in every respect. For example, you might think you are much more or less intelligent than an objective test would measure. Accurate or not, the perceived self is powerful because we believe it reflects who we are. And then in contrast to the perceived self, the presenting self is the public image and the way how you want other people to view you. In most cases, the presenting self we seek to create is a socially approved image. Whether you're trying to project that you're a good student, a loving partner, a good parent, a great worker, a loyal friend, and so on. And the word face is used to describe this socially approved identity and then the term face work to describe the verbal nonverbal ways in which we use to maintain it. Goffman argued 
that each of us can be viewed as a kind of playwright who creates roles that we want other people to believe, as well as the performer who acts out those roles. This playwriting starts early in life as children interact with their parents, and it continues into adulthood in both personal and professional settings. When you think about this, even online, let's look at different social media network networks, for example. What type of image are you trying to present to people on LinkedIn, let's say? What type of public image are you presenting? Generally, that's used for hiring and for businesses to be you know, looking at candidates or you know, to just see other people in a professional way. You're gonna to wanna to present your public image in a very specific way on there to look professional, to look like a hard worker, to you know, wanna get hired. Now let's compare how you're presenting yourself on Instagram. It might be really different. I would like to think that it is still, you know, in a positive way that you want people to see you, but I feel like the things you're posting on there and how you're presenting yourself is very different on let's say Instagram or Facebook or each of the different social media networks that is not specifically just a professional one. So what are some of these characteristics of, of impression management? We strive to manage a multifaceted identity. So people are playing these varied, the variety of roles in different areas of their lives. And they're trying to construct and negotiate multiple identities. And this is one element of competent communication. Impression management is collaborative. We perform like actors to an audience in, through improvising. In, Impression management can be deliberate or it can be unconscious. At times we are aware of managing impressions and at other times we unconsciously act in ways that make an impression on other people. Not sure if you guys can think of examples for this in ways that you act out these rules to manage your impression or specific situations that relate to this. An example could be uh, if you go to a job interview or a first date, you're going to try to act a specific way and manage your impression so that people view you a certain way, whether to like you, to see if you are, can potentially date this person or to try to get the job. But in other cases, you unconsciously act in a way that is a performance for others. An example could be um, in an experiment, participants express facial disgust in reaction to eating sandwiches that had salt water on them, but only when there was another person present. When they were alone, they made no faces. Another study, study showed that communicators engage in smiling or looking sympathetic in response to another person's message, but only in face-to-face -face settings when their expression can be seen by other people. When they're speaking over the phone and the reaction cannot be seen, they do not make the same expression as they would in person. So that's super interesting that we respond a certain way when people are watching us and when they're looking at us, but if you're on the phone, you might not respond or make the same face. So what are other characteristics of impression management? Face-to-face -face impression management operates in three ways. You have manners, which are your words and your behavior. You have your appearance, which are your personal items, and then the setting, which is the physical items. So appearance, how you're dressing, if you're going to a job interview, for example, you're going to generally try to convey a professional view with how you're dressing and how you're showing up and then you might be more formal with your words or shake hands or just be more formal because it's the type of setting that it calls for so impression management and mediated communication uh, offers particular advantages to communicators who want to manage the impressions that they make so it's a lot easier to manage your impressions and sometimes if it's through texting or through emails because um, you have you can really look at the words and what 
what you're sending and how, how people are going to perceive that. Impression management and honesty. So competent communicators know which is the most appropriate face to present depending upon the audience and the situation. And then in the online environment, many people focus on positive features and they might omit or downplay the negative details. But this can raise important ethical questions about impression management online or on social media. Disclosing the self. The subject of self-disclosing communication is the self and information about the self is purposely communicated to another person. The nature of self-disclosure is honesty, revelatory, availability of information and context of sharing. Self-disclosure has the self as a subject. It is intentional, is direct at another person, is honest, is revelatory, contains information generally unavailable from um, other sources, and gains much of its intimate nature from the context in which it's expressed. So two models of self-disclosure show how it works in relationships. First, we have the social penetration model, which involves both the breadth and depth of self-disclosure. So this model is showing the breadth or the depths of the self-disclosure when you're talking to someone. So for example, um, a student self-disclosure in one really in one relationship. The first dimension of self-disclosure in the model involves the breadth of information volunteered, which is the range of subjects that you are discussing. For example, the breadth of the disclosure in your relationship with a fellow coworker, maybe it could expand as you start to reveal information about your life that is away from the job and maybe things that people don't just see when you're at work. The second dimension of, of disclosure is the depth of the information being volunteered, uh, the shift from relatively impersonal messages to more personal ones. Depending on the breadth and depth of information shared, a relationship can be defined as casual or more intimate. In a casual relationship, the breadth may, the breadth may be great, but there's not that much depth. A more intimate relationship is likely to have high depth in at least one area. The most intimate relationships are those in which disclosure is great in both breadth and depth. And this can kind of show that the types of topics that you talk about, maybe at work you talk to people about a lot of different topics, but you don't really go further than that or in more detail to take it past that into a more intimate relationship. And the different types of self-disclosure are clicks, uh, facts, opinions. The Jahari window model is divided into four parts, and that is information that both you and other people are aware of, which is the open area, things unknown to you but known to others, the blind area, information you're aware of but aren't willing to reveal to other, which is the hidden area, and information unknown to both you and others in the unknown area. And to go into a little bit more detail about the, um, about the Jahari window, so essentially you wanna imagine a frame that contains everything there is to know about you, your likes and dislikes, your goals, your secrets, your needs, everything. This frame could be divided into these, into information you know about yourself and things that you don't know. It can also be split into things others know about you and things that they don't know. And these are the different areas that we're talking about within this. So part one represents the information of which both you and the other person are aware. This part is the open area, and then two is the blind area, information you are unaware, and you learn about information in the blind area, primarily through feedback from others. Then the part three of the Johari window represents your hidden area, 
information that you know but you aren't willing to reveal to item to other people items in this hidden area become public primarily through self-disclosure which is the focus of this section and then part four uh, that is the unknown to both you and others we can deduct it existent this exists because we are constantly discovering new things about ourselves for example it is not unusual to discover that you have a new talent that you didn't realize that you had or maybe a new strength or weakness so items can move from the unknown area into the open area when you share your insight or in, into the hidden area if it becomes a secret. And this is the model we're talking about with the open, the blind, the hidden, the unknown, and these different frameworks and the areas that we just discussed. Next, we're going to look at the benefits and the risk of self-disclosure. So neither complete privacy nor complete disclosure is a desirable. So you don't want to be so private that nobody knows anything, but you don't want to be so open that people know every single thing about you, even things they probably don't want to know. So privacy management describes the choices people make to reveal or conceal information about themselves. Benefits of self-disclosure can include uh, self-clarification, -clar self-validation, it's cathartic to share things about yourself, reprocity, impression formation, relationship maintenance and enhancement, and moral obligation. So these are all some of the reasons that you might share things with other people and why it's a positive thing to do. So sometimes you might disclose information in an effort to get things off your chest. I know that I do that a lot. I, I vent about things. I'm not always necessarily looking for a solution or for you to solve my problem or to tell me that everything's gonna be wonderful, but sometimes just talking about things can make you feel better and just getting them off your chest if you um, are stressed about it. And then self-clarification, this can maybe be to clarify your beliefs, opinions, thoughts, attitudes, and feelings, maybe by talking about them with another person. So kind of like talking the problem out, and maybe that just helps you try to figure something out. Self-validation, maybe you disclose information with the hope of seeking the listener's agreement. Like, yeah, I did the right thing. I should have done that. So you're kind of looking for people to validate your behavior or confirm the belief that you hold about yourself. So reprocity is a well-documented conclusion from research is that one person's act of self-disclosure increases the odds that the other person re will reveal personal information. But there's no guarantee that revealing personal information is going to trigger other people to self-disclose. But maybe you can create a comment or a climate that is open and honest and that makes the other person feel comfortable to kind of share information with you. Impression formation, sometimes we reveal personal information to make ourselves more attractive. And the research, research shows that this strategy seems to work. One study reveals that both men's and women's attractiveness was associated with the amount of self-disclosure that they had in a conversation. So for instance, like let's think about a first date. It's not hard to imagine how one or both partners might share personal information to appear more sincere, interesting, sensitive, or curious about the other person. And then when you look at relationship management or maintenance and enhancement, research demonstrates that we like people who disclose personal information to us in fact, the relationship between self-disclosure and liking works in several directions. We like people who disclose personal information to us and we reveal more about ourselves to people that we like. And those are the reasons why you would share, you know, things about that or moral obligation. Sometimes we disclose personal information out of sense of moral obligation maybe if you had a disease that somebody else could potentially catch that would be an example what is the risk of self-disclosure why would you maybe not want to do it rejection negative impression a decrease in relational satisfaction loss of influence loss of control and hurting the other person these are just some of the risks so rejection um 
So people are generally afraid to tell people things because they don't want somebody to not like them or disapprove of what they're doing or how they're feeling. And, you know, nobody likes to be rejected or feel feel like that. Negative impression. So even if the disclosure doesn't lead to total rejection, it can create a negative impression. For example, here, one of the scenarios they used is, you know, I've never had a relationship with um, someone that lasted more than a month. And then somebody might be like, well, really, what does that say about you that you can't have a long term relationship? That would be an example of a negative impression from disclosing information about yourself. Um, a decrease in relational satisfaction besides affecting others' opinions of you. Um, disclosure can lead to a decrease in the satisfaction that comes from a relationship. So let's look at this uh, scenario where one person says, let's get together with Miguel and Jake on Saturday night. And then the other person says, to tell you the truth, I'm tired of seeing Miguel and Jake. I don't have much fun with them. And I think Jake is kind of a jerk. And then the other person gets you know, kind of upset and says, well, they're my best friends. Or loss of influence. Uh, risk of self-disclosure is a potential loss of influence in the relationship. So once you confess something that might be perceived um, as a weakness, your control uh, over how the other person views you is going to be changed. And the same thing of loss of control. If you reveal some personal information about yourself, that means you're losing control of that information. And then what if somebody tells that information to somebody else and you don't want them to? Or hurting the other person. So maybe you reveal something that makes the other person feel upset or they dislike it. Now we start to look at some of the guidelines on when you should self-disclose. So you want to ask yourself, is the other person important to you? So disclosure may be uh beneficial and help develop a more personal relationship with someone maybe it's going to go from a casual you know friendship to more intimate and get to know the person or the same thing in a romantic relationship and then is the risk of disclosing reasonable uh you kind of go through this analysis to determine if the benefits outweigh the risks in the situation of what you're disclosing is a self-disclosure appropriate there's not always you know, it's not always a good time to share things or maybe talk about certain things in certain settings. So you have to think about, is it an appropriate time and place to share or talk about whatever it is at that point? Is the disclosure uh, gonna be reciprocated? So unequal disclosure can create an unbalance in the relationship. Let's say that I'm telling you everything about myself and I'm being super vulnerable, vulnerable in the situation and telling you all these things, but then you don't give me anything back. So it's just a one sided thing and that can make somebody feel uncomfortable. Will the effect be constructive? So self disclosure could be a vicious tool if it's not used carefully. If you are trying to be vulnerable with someone or tell them information that you don't want other people to know, and then they turn it around and use the information against you or tell other people, that could put you in a situation where it wouldn't be positive or make you feel bad. What are the alter alternatives to self-disclosure? Self so silence, uh, when you just keep the information to yourself and maybe that's the best solution to just not talk about it. A lie, so this will, is when you deliberately attempt to hide or misrepresent the truth or you kind of twist it. Or maybe you tell a lie because you're trying not to hurt the other person's feelings. Or next, when you describe statements that are literally false, but clearly avoid an unpleasant truth. Where hinting is a more direct uh, approach and seeks to get the desired response from the other person. Hints may vary according to the situation. And that is all for this chapter. I know this chapter was a little bit longer than before. And this is what we reviewed. So describe how the 
concept is subjective and shaped by and consequently affects communication with other people. Explain how you manage impressions in person and online to enhance your presenting image. Identify an optimal level of self-disclosure and non-disclosure in effective relationships. And that is all for this chapter.